you're a big Twin Peaks fan. I am. How has that show influenced uh, the, the telling of the story here, specifically in Castle Rock? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, I, I, um, I, I think that the reason that I'm here is probably because I was so completely besotted with Twin Peaks when I was, you know, 12 or 13. It sort of like changed the trajectory of my life in a way. Um, I was a real diehard obsessive. Um, I don't know to what extent. I mean, look, I, like I've always loved, and we both have, um, stories of strange happenings in small towns and just stories about. Um, Secrets that lurk behind picket fences, and you know, in this case, the picket fence has been gone for a long time in Castle Rock. But you know, that sort of strain in American storytelling, from like Updike and Cheever through you know, uh, you know, Desperate Housewives and Twin Peaks, and you know, um, and the last show that I created, Manhattan, which is about the birth of the atomic bomb, was also sort of about a kind of bizarro, kind of proto uh, Levitt town of the Cold War. Um, so, um, to a certain extent, I think we just have always been obsessed with stories about um, the dysfunctions of small towns. Um, but Twin Peaks, you know, has such a specific landscape, and it's so steeped in David Lynch's sense of the Northwest. Um, part of, I think, what we always loved as readers of Stephen King was, like, how specific his anthropology of New England and of Maine was, in the sense that, like, he really lovingly, um, you know, uh, kind of became an archivist of small town life there, and so um, it was exciting for us to check in on this town that we've been reading about for a long time and like reimagine it um, in 2018. I was wondering uh, how hands-on Stephen King has been on this project, and also why do you think Hollywood loves him so much? <laughs> um, well, when you're sort of trying to essentially tell a new Stephen King story, um, and, and your fans like we are that grew up on Stephen King and have, have you know revered the writer, um, it was really important to us, and, and, and we never would have done it without uh, his blessing and without a, 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 a feeling that we were delivering something creatively that he was going to be happy with. You know, I think that ultimately we were we we every character choice, every setting of his um, that we wanted to use in this first season, um, we we went to him and, and would make sure that he was comfortable with it, and, and that and that ultimately, um, you know, I think part of it is you look at a character like Alan Pangborn, who is sort of the, the center of a couple of the great Castle Rock novels, and he's an important player in our season. Um, we were coming back to Alan Pangborn, you know, 30 years later, and, um, and and really it was important to us to know that Steve was comfortable with us sort of telling the, the, the postscript to the Alan Pangborn uh, stories that had already been written. So it, it's been a back and forth, and, and, and you know, I think we, we obviously cherish every interaction we get to have in every way way that, that, that we can talk to him about the stories and, and, and hope to continue to. In the, sa in the same way that in, with Doctor Who, for example, the fan becomes the producer, the producer that becomes the producer of the show he's a fan of. How do you balance objectivity and fandom in the sense that, I mean, I, I, I don't expect you to tell us what you think the worst thing about Stephen King's writing is, but you have to, in some way, be objective enough to understand his strengths and weaknesses to, to make this work, surely. Well, I mean, I, one thing that we did, which was really interesting, like, so we, you know, as in almost any other TV uh, project, you get a team of writers together and um, you plan out what the season's going to look like, um, and you break the stories together. Something that's a little different about this show is we sort of had to have like a kind of like graduate level seminar on Stephen King among our writers. And for one thing, the library is so huge, there's no possibility that either one of us is going to be able to sit down and read all of those books. So we had to sort of divide and conquer, and we would sit around and try to um, anatomize what it is that makes a Stephen King story a Stephen King story. Like what, when those books are most transporting, what is sort of like essential to the DNA of the stories um, and then to try to kind of reverse engineer it ourselves. So I don't know if that qualifies as objectivity, but it was really interesting to try to, um, you know, uh, sometimes it can be like telling a joke when you explain why it's funny, it's not funny anymore, but to sort of like look at a book that, you know, transports you or a book that has haunted you and, and, and to try to take it apart and figure out what the sort of constituent parts are. Thank you. Uh,
Right. I mean, one thing that like I've always felt about that is like, in in a way, he's, he almost sort of invented psychological horror. The books are so psychological and they're so character driven. You know, in the end, like um, you look at The Shining, like there's a relatively low body count, but there is something so harrowing, particularly now as the father of a couple of young kids, about the idea that you might lose your bearings and find yourself in a position where you might um, hurt the people you love best and um, whose job, uh, you know, your job is to protect them. There's, there's something so disturbing about that idea and it's a sort of interiority of it that I think is so provocative. So um, a lot of it for us was, you know, there are some uncanny and um, unexplainable events that take place over the even over the first handful of episodes, but it was important to us that they always be presented subjectively through the point of view of a character, not presented objectively to an audience as sort of like uh, you know, uh, you know, a kind of thrill on a you know roller coaster. Yeah, and I think one thing we, we love about Stephen King is the way that you can go on a, a Stephen King ride and never know exactly what ride you're on, where you can sort of start in one place as a story, and then you look at the stand and. Think about how it's basically an outbreak novel at the beginning, which is you know ostensibly something that could really happen, and by the end you are uh, you know standing in another world with Randall Flag on a on a you know on a mountaintop and he's being worshipped by by um, others, and so. You know, I think that, that that sense of the unexpected was something that we really wanted to achieve, and I think, too, that that connects to the tone question, because it, it, it's the fact that these early episodes start in a very grounded way um, may belie some of where we're ultimately headed. What? Do you think Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, definitely. I mean, there'll be times where, like, Dusty would hand in a script and be like, do you see what I did there on page 36? And I, was, yeah, I, have, no, I have not a fucking clue. That's yeah. between me and page 36. Yeah. <laughs> well, what's uh, the process then in coming up with these? Or, or do you have like a library of Stephen King references? And you're like, these do not fit this world. These definitely fit. And then do a process of elimination because it's very immersive and not overt. Um, we, uh, I think there are a whole lot of different kinds of um, Easter eggs and sidelong wings and kind of cross references and crossover characters that sort of weave their way through this first season, and they operate at all levels. You know, so like um, it's a prison story, and there's Shawshank, and that obviously is going to be gratifying or mean something to somebody who's a fan of that movie. Um, but there are a lot of sort of like much, much, much deeper cuts that uh, you know we hope that you know sort of like PhD level fans will sort of ferret out. You know, um, I think the, the only rule for us was that like. It felt important that they all be organic to the story, essentially. You know, like, it's not, um, we didn't want the show to, like, to devolve into, like, pop-up video of Stephen King, or, like, a word jump. Do you know what I mean? Um, I would watch it, too, actually. But, yeah. Were there, were there you... any books that you wanted to nod to that you couldn't in this? You know, I, I think, um... The, the, there's certainly uh, a sort of universe of Stephen King that is set around the, the small towns, and, and that's sort of part of his library. And then there's, and then there's the you know sort of epic novels like the, the Stand, and, and, and then and then finally I think we're sort of on the other side of it. There's there's the Dark Tower, and I think um, not even from a we really wanted to use the Dark Tower in, in, in this season, but but couldn't. But more from a, um, I think Sam Sam sometimes says that like once you go to the Dark Tower, you can never come back. Can't come back from the Dark Tower. And so it's like, and, that, and I think that's really true. Which is like, I think that as you're building a Stephen King universe, you have to be pretty judicious about about not entering into the territories that that, that it's almost impossible to recover from when it comes to the supernatural and you know multiple worlds and all the things that, that we know about the Stephen King library. You guys, I'm going to have to hold them. We are. say favorite Stephen King and why that book affected you more than the other. Pet Cemetery was the first that I ever read, and I think I'm still scarred by it and working it out. So I, that's what I will say, because that's the one that damaged me. Um, I'm a stand man in mm -hmm. my in my heart, uh, and, and always have been. He's just braggy because it's really long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.